Welcome to AEC Stories, the USS Mount Hood podcast. Today I've got a special guest, Logan Weaver, former SM1 slash bosun's mate, and that will be part of the story. Anyways, I uh, met Logan on Facebook, so how are you doing today, Logan? Hanging in the best I can, thanks. Thank you for having me on board. Yeah, I appreciate it, and I like it when I get new people from different ships because, you know, I, I tried for a while getting a lot of people from my ship, and I get a, I get quite a few, but not everybody's up to it or there, so now I've been around the fleet from battleships to amphibious ships to submarines, it doesn't really matter because all sea stories are good stories as far as I'm concerned. And same with the audience, you know, the people that listen, they really like it. Um, so you have an interesting story. I mean, you were there and I've seen this posted that you went, you were there in the Navy. You came in about the same time I did just a few months before or whatever. And then you stayed in for the rest of the time. And towards the end of your enlistment, they switched you over to bosun's mate. So I'd like to know about that, but maybe we could start with, Where'd you join the Navy, and uh, what did you think from the beginning? Right. Well, uh, oh, by the way, not my not the end of my enlistment, but the end of my career. <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a better term. You're right. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're going to be more on top. Right on. At any rate, uh, well, let's see here. I joined the Navy. I was in uh, living in California and wanted to uh, try and get uh, into a different place than where I was. So I uh, joined the Navy, went to boot camp in uh, San Diego in 1987. Went to uh, Sigelman A School after that, uh, going from October to December. I was in the last graduating class of 1987. There was uh, usually there was supposed to be about uh, 30 to 50 people per class, and we had 15. Wow. Um, so I remember this about A School. You get to pick where you got stationed based on how well you did in the class. Was that told to you up front? Because I don't remember being it told to me, and I was having so much fun, I should have studied a little harder, but it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, uh, it, it was told to me up front, yes. And it was interesting because I had a something like uh, 87 average or something like that, something pretty solid, but yet I was second lowest in the class. So that lets you know just how good them other people were. <laughs> 82nd, I would have done well. <laughs> <laughs> well. You see, I mean, uh, you, you're just getting to know me, but my, my, my goal was to get to California because I watched a lot of advertising and movies. And I thought mm -hmm. that's the place to live. And, you know, coming from the East Coast, coming from Europe on a military base, I'm like, I looked at my high school, I go, who are the cool kids? Well, the Californians seem pretty cool. I don't want to move to Alabama. Sorry, guys from Alabama. I just didn't want to move there. You didn't send the good representatives over there, but the Californians did. <laughs> so of all the being a military brat, you get kids from all 50 states that are their dads in the military. And I was like, where do I want to live? Because we didn't really have a home base. My parents were still living in Europe when I joined. So I was like, hmm, where to go? And California was my dream. And you're like anywhere else but where you were in California, which is kind of funny. <laughs> Uh, where did you, uh, what did you get to pick from? What were your options for duty stations? Honestly, I don't recall, uh, but I ended up getting a, uh, choosing a helicopter carrier called an LPH, uh, a amphibious assault helicopter carrier, uh, out of, uh, Norfolk, Virginia. Oh, pretty cool. That's, uh, I was wondering about the amphib Navy. Did you get a chance to do any, uh, beach master work? I know that was part of our rate back then. If you could go do that or something. Oh uh, no, we were uh, the LPH. It was a uh, helicopter carrier, not something which had uh, which had the small craft. And if I understand right, the uh, Beachmaster side of Sigelman is something which would be uh, you would have to get uh, detailed specifically to that uh, that duty with the Beachmaster unit. That's right. You caught me slipping because you said helicopter. I'm going, oh, wait, they're landing the helicopter. No, they're not what, driving the helicopters to the water, landing them on the shore. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, no, I, I had one of our uh, SM2s. He was a beach master at one time, and he was just loving it, life on the beach, you know, <laughs> and just doing a lot of drills or whatever, I think, in San Diego. But that was always, you know, because there wasn't a lot of options for us as signalmen. I mean, we were either on a ship, uh, recruiting duty, Maybe some kind of master at arms somewhere, um, or perhaps beach master, right? I reckon, yeah. 
Did you either do any of those or, things? Yeah, that or maybe pushing boots. Yeah, pushing boots there. That's another one. Yeah, back when so, they call it a uh, CC company commander, but now they call it was it RDC recruit division commander. I think. Wow. Yeah, you're gonna have to update me because I get out in '93 and I'm like, I uh, lost the words. I know we had company <laughs> commanders when I was in. Um, yeah. Well, you're gonna you know. you're gonna really love it because there's all kinds of acronyms which they had floating around, like the what is that? I, there's one which I which cracked me up. It's called oh, Sink us Navier. So the Sink Commander in Chief, us U.S. Navier, Naval Forces Europe. Sink us Navier. <laughs> How's that for an acronym? It sounds like a very uh, fine French chef. He's a Cinque Sevier. Right? He uh, makes <laughs> the <French. laughs> He's a Navier. You know, he's one of them. He's, he makes the good food. <laughs> you know, one of those guys. <laughs> so the, the helicopter thing, what was that duty like? What was it like being on a helicopter carrier? Well, it was sort of like being on a... Uh, uh, aircraft carrier, which had been left in the dryer too long. <laughs> Good description. Yeah. It, it, you know, the aircraft carrier, the big old full size ones are thousand to eleven hundred feet long, roughly. And ours was just about six hundred foot long. So it was okay. definitely smaller. It was probably about the size of a uh, World War II aircraft carrier. And actually, come to think of it, some of the uh, other, um, LP, LPHs were converted from escort carriers, uh, from around that time, if I remember correctly. Uh, cause our, uh, the, the Guam LPH9, that's the one which I was on. It was an Iwo Jima class from LPH2, but they had other ships in there, which were, uh, the names of them escaped me for, I remember one was the Block Island and, uh, that was a converted escort carrier. And, uh, also nicknamed the Jeep carrier. But, uh, yeah, they had some which they converted from these escort carriers over to LPH. And then they, uh, finished up the rest with, uh, the actual, uh, built as LPHs. Interesting. So was that a pretty good sized crew on there? How many people did you have on board? Oh, it was pretty good size. We, uh, well, we had two different, Sizes. We had the, when we just had ship's company and then when we had all the, uh, the, the troops on board. Um, ship's company was about 600, I think. And, uh, when we had everybody on board, I think I heard the total amount of people was somewhere around the lines of, uh, like 2000 or 2200, but don't quote me. That's, that's huge. We only had like 400 people or 350 fluctuating. Mm. My goodness. So was that, was there, um, I don't know. I mean, what was life like on that? Was it really busy? Did you guys do a lot of deployments? Well, I did uh, one and a half deployments on that ship. I, I, uh, reported for duty in the beginning of, uh, on New Year's day in 1988. And, um, it was, I, I, I got some stories I can tell you about uh, reporting for duty there. Oof. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, they had a, a, a bomb scare. Um, on New Year's Day for that ship. So they were checking all the, um, all the luggage of everybody coming on board. Well, there was a guy who was one of my fellow signalmen and, uh, he had brought some things on board, which were not supposed to be brought on board. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So they started getting really extremely hardcore and they decided, well, this guy, he, put those things on board the ship, which he knew that he wasn't supposed to put on board, and he put a whole bunch of it on there. So we're going to automatically put him on report, and we're going to give him pre-mast restriction and give him, uh, uh, as one of his punishments, we're going to make him duty signalman today. So when I showed on up a few hours later on, guess who I had meeting me on the quarter deck? But the guy <laughs> who was about ready to go to captain's mast and maybe even court-martial. Oh my gosh. Sounds like he's like, so how's life on the ship? Oh, it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get the bad news. Bad news. Charlie is your greeter, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Either that or the, uh, the guy who you can say is, uh, you know, up to no good. And the last person you want to be as the, the first impression was the per the person who I got as my first impression. Oh my gosh. That's what happens. I mean, you could go to a place and just be sucked in with the bad crowd real quick. 
oh, and yeah. not know it, not know it till later. Uh, thank oh, this you. This is how exactly. it normally operates. <laughs> yeah, I, I went. I went for my first three days on that ship, not having my own rack. I was. It was like it was like one of those training videos that they showed about like there's this one which they called the first 72 hours. You know, the first 72 hours on board ship, and uh, basically it shows this guy who. Um, the video begins with this guy who's at captain's mask getting kicked out. And he says, well, how does this happen? The captain asked this guy. And so flashback to when he first showed up and it was just, a, it was just a list of, it was like a comedy of errors. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's funny. You bring that up. I mean, not just to interject this when I showed up mm. to Sigmund a school, I was having drinks. I don't know why they served us. I wasn't old enough, uh, at O'Hare, uh, where I was leaving from boot camp to go to, you know, Orlando. And they're like, here, sailors. So we were pretty hammered. And by the time I got to Sigma A school all by myself, cause everybody at the bar went different directions, different planes, different ships, right? Oh, yeah. And I, I walk in to the duty, whoever he was, and I have a sea bag on. And I'm pretty strong, pretty fit guy, but I had, uh, you know, rubber legs at this point from all the drinking. <laughs> and I go in, you know, SMS and Debsy reporting for duty, sir. And I just fell back on the sea bag that was on my back like a turtle. He <laughs> 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 slipped out from under me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what the hell? <laughs> like it was a chief. <laughs> Wow. And my feet were fluttering up in the air and they sent some guys to pick me up. And these guys were really cool. They're like, oh, bro, you smell like booze. You can't show up like this. They're going to nail you here. Let's take them over here. Get them some coffee before they took me to the barracks. They were so awesome. Oh, that's yeah, good. there was a good camaraderie. I, I appreciated that. But uh, yeah, that was uh, that was entertaining. So, yeah, that kind of guy met you. So I basically met you. <laughs> 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 so. Well, From this, there, guy, I mean, this guy was not, this guy was, was not sneaking on board booze. No. No. It was something much more strong. Wow. Yeah. So he was going to have a, a good party on there, I guess. Either that or he's going to yeah. give that for somebody else to have a good party. I don't know. He had quite a bit. Maybe he was opening a distribution center of sorts. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Uh, Who knows? They say that know, they say that uh, the carrier is a small city. I guess that includes having a drug problem. <laughs> that's that's for sure. I mean, our ship it wasn't so rampant, but our ship was it was easy to see and hear everybody, so there was less likely to have mischief. I guess mm. you know it was a little more intimate. But on a big ship, somebody's got to hustle. I mean, I, I've had. People on here that were in the Vietnam era, and they told me about, uh, I don't know whether they told me in the podcast or not, there was guys just bringing on tons of weed from Vietnam, mm. and then they pull into port, and there's some ship waiting to inspect the whole ship and drug dogs. <laughs> They're like, oops, <laughs> you know, <laughs> get rid of that dirty lettuce. You know, that's what it was about. <laughs> dirty lettuce. <laughs> <You know? laughs> A little more liberal. They didn't have, uh, you know, the P test and all that back then. So, you know. Oh, when yes. we were Operation in, Golden when we were Pearl. in, yes, that was what they called it in Orlando. That's what I remember. <laughs> and I, I was lucky to be in charge of that at one time. <laughs> lucky enough? Yeah, lucky. I'm being sarcastic. Of oh, course. okay. okay. And, yeah. But, uh, yeah, now you're in charge of the Golden Rainbow, whatever, you know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> now you're the so where did, where did you go on your first deployment? Well, first deployment was in 1988. We deployed with the, uh, we were actually the flagship. The USS Guam was the flagship for Com Fibron 4. And we had five ships with us, uh, total with us, including us. It was us. We had one LPD, which was the USS Nashville, LPD 13. We had the USS Pensacola, LSD 38. We had the uh, USS Charleston, LKA 113. And we had the USS Fairfax County, LST-1193. And as a signalman, that was a nightmare. Because wow. we, when we call ships, I'm mentioning this for the uh, the people who are not signalmen. When, uh, when our ship calls another ship, we call using the first letter of the ship for like, if it's like LPH or LSD or LKA, LPD. And then the last number of its 
um, of its uh, hull number. So yeah. for LPH nine, that'd be Lima nine, Lima pennant nine. Yeah. And so if you know, if we called the Pensacola, that's what we appreciated, because that'd be Lima pennant eight. But yeah. we had the, <laughs> we had the Nashville LPD thirteen the three, <laughs> then the Charleston one thirteen. Then we had the, the Fairfax County eleven ninety three. I did say eleven. Wow. I did say Fairfax County, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I didn't have a chance to rush through any notes or anything. Yeah. But uh, yeah. So anytime that we had like a a, a Lima pin at three is like uh, it's like which one? So you guys didn't have regular call signs, like four-letter call signs, or you guys were just doing this for short because you're all traveling together? Oh, yeah, there is there is the international, the four-letter international call signs, yes. But see, as far as for, like, when we're actually calling somebody up, calling somebody up, calling somebody up, um, and we just hope and pray that we don't end up with two Lima Pennant threes lined up behind one another, because then <laughs> we could end up calling the second one that the first one answers. Or we can end up calling the first one and the second one answers. And then here we are trying to, you know, to unscramble the wires, so to speak. And how do you unscramble such wires, you know? Oof. So, so you, you had a lot of, uh, was there any miscommunications? What? The captain says what? He said what? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, we don't need it. No, we don't need any ice cream. What the hell are you saying? Right? <laughs> oh, we, we talk about it. We always need ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's kind of like a who's on first game, you know? <laughs> oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah. But uh, is yeah, your was... captain so and so? No, is your admiral? Oh, oh, okay. That's you. I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, we had a, I'm speaking of, we had a senior captain on board who was a, uh, he was referred to as a Commodore and um, not a one star admiral. Uh, which they sometime during my time in the Navy, they changed the one star Commodore to a one star rear admiral. And then what previously had been a two star as being rear admiral, they changed mm-hmm. it to being rear admiral lower half for the one star and rear admiral upper half for the two star. Don't ask me all that stuff. I don't know. It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> They've reconfigured that. And then they were going to get rid of the rates, but they decided to keep the rates or something I read about. I'm, I'm not too up to date on all that. I just know that we had rates when we were in and we were signalmen and then they got rid of us. Well, I've heard is, that uh, saying, I've heard that saying you, that was before my time. Well, as regarding the loss of rates, that was after my time. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that was such a bizarre thing. And it's like, you know, and I always talk about this on some of the other podcasts about those ships, you know, having collisions like, no, mm. we would have been on the signal bridge and uh, that would not have happened, you know? Yeah. And it's, uh, there's some things that have changed though. Cause I did a podcast the other day with the OS two and her husband got out two years ago and she was telling me that they basically, um, they've been on 10 to 12 month deployments. And I don't know if you were getting part of that, but they were only six months when we were in. Yep. Back in my day. Yeah. Well, that first deployment that I made, it was six months. It, uh, actually, we did a combined uh, deployment. I don't know how common it was or was not. Uh, this is my first one ever, so I didn't know. At any rate, but it was us with the Guam battle group with Fibron 4 on board. And we crossed the Atlantic with the John F. Kennedy carrier battle group, which had okay. carrier group 2 on board. <clears throat> And uh, I used to be able to remember every single one of the ships that we had in yeah. our battle group. And uh, I, <laughs> I used to get some, oh, I used to get some ribbon from uh, my fellow signalman. Because I used to be sitting, you know, say, oh, hey, Weaver, what, what, what was the ships that we were on, what we were deploying with last year? Because you know, this would be like in 1990. And uh, so, they, oh, yeah, back in 1990 or 1988, yeah, we played with, uh, you know, and I'd rattle off the different ship numbers with the hull numbers and the, their international call sites. <laughs> and they were just shaking their head. <laughs> you must have moved up pretty quick with your rate then. You were, it sounds like you were pretty squared away. Well, thanks. I uh, I got up to being SM2 and then... Everything stopped. 
Oh, the PNA, the PNA mafia came and got a hold of you. Is what happened? <laughs> well, that was the end of the Cold War. Is what happened. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Uh, yeah. AG, AGI visual specialists were gone. Yeah, yeah. So, for those who are listening who don't know, you want to tell them what PNA is? That's pass not advanced. I did it twice for E five. I passed it twice, but they were not advancing any other signal. And at my rate, I mean. I think like there was maybe one or two in the whole fleet. And I'm like, what did that guy have to do? Catch a bullet for an admiral as a bodyguard or something, you know? <laughs> I mean, what, what extreme circumstance was it? A, was it perhaps a, a Navy SEAL um, signalman, you know, that got advanced <laughs> who never get to use a semaphore and stuff, but mm-hmm. because of other factors, who knew? I mean, I'm kind of being sarcastic, but really, how did you know? And I know some people, that would get a lot of different duties that kept them from working in their rate. So they couldn't advance either. Mm -hmm. Yep. That was one of the biggest problems that we had as Sigmund is that uh, it was a C duty only job. Um, There really wasn't much of anything shore duty we could do as a in rate job. Uh, I heard that. I heard that there was like one or two billets over in Gitmo, Cuba at the, uh, the uh, shore signal station, the tower, and I heard that there might have been also over in Pearl Harbor, but this is just this is just hearsay. I have no I I cannot confirm it. Yeah, it's just it yeah. could just be pure sea story. It could be. It could be like the bowling alley on a carrier. <laughs> 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 it could be one of those things, right? I mean, maybe. So what was uh what was it like for you going overseas the first time? What ports kind of impressed you and you know, getting away from California kind of opened your eyes to the other part of the world. Well, actually, before uh, we we didn't deploy until uh, the latter part of '88, so um, I spent basically the the entire year on the East Coast. We went up. We went up to uh, we went down in, in February of all things. We went when it was freezing cold. We went down to St. Thomas, Virgin Islands. So everybody was having a cold showing up down in St. Thomas, Virgin Islands, because it was so cold up in Virginia, and it was so hot down in St. Thomas. And um, so we dropped the hook, and we were uh, went on over there and had uh, liberty there, and I had no idea. I was not just new. I was so unfamiliar and so not ready. <laughs> But, yeah, uh, we ended up uh, visiting, uh, let's see here, St. Thomas, Virgin Islands. We went up to Yorktown to the uh, Naval Weapons Station there um, up in Virginia. Uh, we later on went to New York. Yeah, we went to New York also when it was still kind of cold. Uh, they had Fleet Week up there. And we pulled into the uh, we pulled into the pier alongside the USS Intrepid, the uh, the Carrier Museum. And mm-hmm. uh, with the one which uh, a lot of people now know from the, the Nicolas Cage movie, one of those, um, I can't remember the name of it. But it just came out too, right? It's on Netflix, I think. Well, everything is on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> Nicolas Cage on a boat on Netflix. Find it. No. <laughs> yeah, but it's, but it's a boat that doesn't float. Oh, wait, it does float, but it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> CGI. CGI and Nicolas Cage made a great movie together. Yeah, there we go. I mean, back in the day, I mean, they used to use real ships to make some of those movies yep. and uh, back in the John Wayne movies. Mm-hmm. And like I said, I had two signalmen. They're in their late se- mid to late seventies that were on there. I did podcasts with them and they were telling me what it was like to be a signalman hanging out with John Wayne, you know, before I was born, before you were born. Wow. <laughs> so to think before we were born, signalmen were doing what we were doing. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. Definitely. So, so yeah, did, so, I went up and, get, so we went up down Europe? and... Sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. I said, did you get to Europe from there? I, I didn't mean to... Yeah. <laughs> I think we cut each other. I'm sorry about that. Um, so we went up and down, a, a, um, hit a couple of, a couple of ports. But um, the funniest thing, which I never knew, was that when a helicopter carrier deploys, they deploy you know, from the home port of the of the ship norfolk virginia in this case and then we went down and we pulled in to take on marines which is about a one-day event so we go down to i think it was called moorhead city north carolina don't quote me and we took on board the uh the battalion landing team and uh, uh 
Marine Expeditionary Unit and uh, what's the, uh, what's the HMM, so it's a Marine Medium Helicopter Squadron. Um, yeah, so we, 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 so it's like, wait a minute, I thought we were supposed to be crossing the, the Atlantic. And, uh, so no, well, we pulled in. Well, then the next day after that, we pulled out again. Then we were <laughs> across the Atlantic. <laughs> when then we met up with the, uh, the, the, uh, John F. Kennedy battle group, um, about a day and a half out, I guess it was. And we crossed together and we had more ships. Uh, this was told to me from one of my senior signalmen. We had more ships in that combined battle group crossing the Atlantic than anything crossing the Atlantic since World War II. Wow. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Yeah. So, and, uh, we, uh, we crossed on over, um, we pulled into Rota, Spain, which is on the, uh, the, on the, uh, ocean side, the Atlantic side, excuse mm-hmm. me, the Atlantic side of, um, the, uh, oh, what's the name of that big rock? Rock Gibraltar. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, um, yeah, it's a good landmark. Yeah. And, uh, so we pulled in there. That's where we did our uh, turnover with the, uh, other battle group. And, uh, well, and you know, well, there we did. We had some uh, Liberty Ops still going on. We got brought in in these cattle cars. Oh man, those cattle cars were hot. Yeah, <laughs> it's like you wanted to stand by by the uh, by the windows because if you weren't standing by the windows, it was not just hot and breezy. It was just hot and miserable. But at least if you're by the window, it'd be hot and breezy. Yeah, Spain could get pretty damn hot. I was there as a kid. I was actually at Rota at one time. Ah. And that sand, did you go to the beach? Because the sand will burn your feet off. <laughs> That's what I remember. That's how much it soaks up the sun. It's one of those places like you're like trying to run to your beach towel going hot, 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 hot. Oh, my gosh, hot. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I, it's like I remember he, seeing some movie where some guy paid another guy to give him a piggyback <laughs> to go from his beach towel to be standing in the in, in the water, you know, to be just standing like knee deep in the water. <laughs> that That's kind of what that's like. Um, so what did you think about Spain? I mean, after being a stateside guy, well, your first foreign port, it was, it was definitely interesting. It was definitely different. And, uh, I was definitely not ready for it. They had, uh, this is well before the, uh, had the European union combination, and everything. So they had, uh, the, uh, Spanish peseta was their uh, currency there. It was the peseta. And of course we called, we had different nicknames from like the potatoes and the, you know, <laughs> how many potatoes do you have? Enough to party tonight? Yeah, well, how many? Right, yeah, exactly. How many potatoes can I get for this dollar? Yeah. Were, were they having you guys drink uh, bags of wine or what? No, but they did have beer on the pier, and they had uh, a uh, uh, money exchanger on the pier, and um, they had a pretty good they had a pretty good setup over there on the pier. Yeah, so that uh, even even if you didn't want to get out there. Out, you know, out into town, you could, uh, you know, stretch your land legs a little bit and, uh, you know, you know, try to decompress a little bit. You know, the people who have never served at sea don't really understand fully what it's like to be at sea. It is like nothing else. It's nobody can really explain it. It's like if something goes wrong, you've got you and your shipmates to deal with it. And yeah. if you, if things go wrong, you don't get a chance of being, you know, like with the other branches, they have this thing called base, uh, base recovery plan or something like. And yeah, there is no, there is no ship recovery plan. <laughs> if the ship sinks, the no. ship sinks. Yeah. And, uh, um, yeah, there's, there's nobody saving Superman. No, no, no. no. <laughs> you got to be very self sufficient. You got to be a great firefighter. You got to be able to handle your NBC drills and your comm drills and know your flags and, There's a lot to know. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you don't really think about it as a young man. You think about it after the fact, like, whoa, what was I getting myself into? (laughs) Yeah. At least, well, maybe not you. You stayed in it long (laughs) enough for it to probably kick somewhere along down the line. But, uh, in my six years, I was like, oh, okay, that was interesting. But (laughs) yeah, I was, uh, Um, I found out that, um, in order to be a, uh, good, effective shipboard signalman, it had to not be just a signalman on the signal bridge. You also have to be a, a good uh, watchstander on the deck watch in port. You have to be a good sarboat signalman, whether in port or at sea, uh, typically at sea. 
you have to be a uh, good firefighter, uh, whether at sea or in port, typically on the import fire party. Also, you have to be a good RNA signalman, which is the signalman communicating back to the ship, but also knows how to do the firefighting thing if they need it. Uh, you have to be a good uh, stretcher bearer team member. You have to know your first aid. You have to know your uh, ship self-defense force stuff. I mean, th- there's just this ongoing list. Yeah. You're a human Swiss Army knife, basically. <laughs> Better have a spoon, a magnifying glass, and a saw. Be ready. Yeah, that's uh, no. You, you had to, you had a lot of different responsibilities. That's what's different from being in the Navy than being in other branches. I'm sure there's responsibilities being like on a C-130 where it's just us. We better figure it out. Emergency landing, you know, blah blah blah. You yeah. know, but uh, you know, it's it's different than going out to a foxhole. But then then they the Army guys have a whole different responsibility. But uh, the, the Navy. You know, I wasn't trying to join the Navy. I just did. I didn't have a dream. I met a lot of guys like, I wanted to be like my grandpa. I'm like, um, I didn't like the Air Force or the Army, so I joined the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> that that was my easy solution. So where did you go from Spain? Right. So from Spain, we actually went through the Rock of Gibraltar into uh, the Mediterranean. Um, we hit... We hit port in uh, Palma de Mallorca, Spain. So that's the island of Mallorca. The name of the, uh, the city is Palma in Spain. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We had um, we uh, we were joking around a little bit. We ended up we had no idea um, that we were going to be seeing so much of Spain. We had different things planned, yeah. but you know how the, how's that saying? Uh, the main word in the Navy is flexibility. Yeah, so we had uh, a lot changed. So our uh, we had plans to go to all kinds of different ports, and we ended up going to Spain and Spain and Spain and Spain. And Oh, hey, we actually went to Israel. And that was really awesome, going to Israel. Going to Haifa, Israel, we pulled in. And uh, it was, I mean, you want to talk about history. Wow. It is truly the cradle of history. It is history personified. So much history. It's so amazing. It doesn't really matter what, what your worldview is. It's the, you know, Israel is the, the cornerstone of three major religions. It's truly amazing, you know? And I had the chance to be there, had a chance to, uh, go visit Jerusalem and to, uh, visit the uh, Western Wall, otherwise known as the Wailing Wall. Uh, I had a chance to, uh, go, uh, walk down the Villa, what's it called? The Villa della Rosa, uh, where, uh, Jesus was, uh, T- carrying his uh, cross when he got uh, taken up to uh, be hang- hanged on the cross. And um, also I was on, uh, had a chance to, uh, I was on the tour, which went on over to, I th- oh no, not Bethlehem. That's right. Bethlehem was a demilitarized zone at the time. Um, yeah, we, they, they, they were very specific about, yeah, we don't want our military guys going into a demilitarized zone. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we, uh, we had a chance to see all kinds of different amazing places. We had a chance to see these kibbutzes, which uh, they're like communal type uh, farming communities, uh, which are rather unique to uh, Israel and uh, so where everybody has their own job within it and everybody doesn't have their own wage. They put all their wages into a communal pot and they withdraw from that as, a, as according to what their needs are. Um, we also uh, had a chance to, uh, go over and visit the Sea of Galilee. And that was huge. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, I, <laughs> the, uh, it was amazing just how quick the weather changed. We were, uh, sitting there and in like 10 minutes, we watched the, the Sea of Galilee go from calm to just choppy and white caps. And yeah, it was like, oof. Yeah, bad stuff. Yeah. Neptune fired up. He fired up his motors. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. He's like, here you go, boys. Here's some waves. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know. The, that sounds pretty it cool. It was. It was extremely cool. And it wasn't as expensive as people were saying. I heard, actually, I heard this joke on this movie. Um, can't remember the name of the movie off the top of my head. But there was this, uh, there's this, people, there's these two families. They're sitting down talking. And they're to talk about how, oh, well. I went, yeah, we went over to, uh, to Israel, visit the Holy Land. Oh, really? How was it? Oh, it was great, but things were so expensive. 
And uh, they were talking about, so, yeah, was, we wanted to go on a ride on the Sea of Galilee, but we couldn't. It was just too expensive. And then this snarky teenage son of the other fellow says, well, no wonder why Jesus walked. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit irreverent there. Yeah. <laughs> That must have been pretty neat. That's just being in a country that was all militarized, like everybody, you know, joins the military. Um, it's very military culture oriented. Well, they have to be, otherwise, otherwise they will not be existing anymore. Yeah, I mean, at any given time, they can be, you know, going coming under attack. Yeah, they're hardcore, man. Well, so, from where'd you go? Where did you go from Israel? Did you do more Persian Gulf stuff? Or oh, back to Europe. We did not go to the Persian Gulf at all. No, um, we had one of our ships. From the five that were with us, went over to um, Persian Gulf area. I can't remember which one it was, and but uh, yeah, we had a one of our uh, one of our guys from Weapons Division. I think it was a fire controlman. Ended up going TAD to that ship, and um, they went on over and um, saw some combat action. Yeah. yeah. There was there was a lot of stuff popping off in those in that area. Oh yeah, we also had the uh, um, the Libya thing going on, and there was the question of if we were going to get called over for that. And I'm not too sure if any of the aircraft carrier, uh, if the John F. Kennedy's aircraft got sent over from the carrier to take care of business there, but I don't know if it did or didn't. Now, but we did not though, not for the not for the USS Guam. That's pretty interesting. So after the Guam, did you get shore duty or did you get another ship? Well, actually, uh, we ended up, I, we ended up coming back from the, from the deployment. We, uh, oh, by the way, we had, we, uh, hit port in, uh, Marseille, France, uh, spent Christmas there and, uh, had Barbara Mandrell, uh, coming on board and doing a USO show. That was pretty awesome. Also while there, I had a chance to, That's uh, yeah, out. had a chance to get on the, uh, what's it called? The TGV train. Uh, that's the uh, French bullet train. I th- somebody told me what TGV stands for. It's it's like the <laughs> we just like to say it's the the go fast train. Yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it, for the French, the for, yeah, feel free to to Google it and and you'll find out what TGV means. Anyway, though, but yeah, I had a chance to go all the way on up there to Paris from Marseille. Marseille is down there on the on the Mediterranean coast. Went all the way up to 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 uh, Paris. Spend a uh, like a two or three day tour. Got to check out the sites. Got to see the Louvre Museum. Got to you know see the uh, Eiffel Tower, et cetera, et cetera. It was really awesome. And um, yeah, you get to you get out there and saw some stuff. Some guys just saw the inside of a bar. It was pretty cool <laughs> that you did that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I found out that it kind of matters who you hang out with when you're on Liberty, because there's some people who they're interested in. Um, well, unwinding yeah. with the, uh, with, <laughs> with the liquid. Yeah. <laughs> having, uh, having yeah. the, uh, what's that called? The hundred proof relaxant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. The liquid layaway. Yeah. <laughs> get down. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> but yeah, so, um, That's... it was, it was great to be able to, uh, have some of that experience. I, I wish I would have had a chance to do more, but I, you know, looking back on it, yeah, hindsight is 2020. But, uh, so yeah, we, uh, oh, by the way, before we pulled into, uh, to France the night before, we had the most crazy storm. It came up out of nowhere. Our weather guys were just flummoxed. And our, 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 uh, air department guys were trying to get all the aircraft moved either down below deck or to the stern of the ship to keep it, to keep them from getting hit by these waves. And we were taking some pretty serious waves. I, I think they said, I, I can't remember for sure, but I think they said that the, uh, that there was something as high as like 35 or 40 foot waves. Yeah. We were taking, oh man, it was, it was, it, they must have been 30 foot waves to be crashing that high. Yeah. It was, it was pretty serious though. Oh, well, once they started, once the, we started hitting the seas, the, uh, weather decks were, were closed and, the uh, air department air boss just says, no, we're leaving what aircraft is there, there. We're not going to risk the lives of anybody to move the aircraft. And also, if it's moving around, we'll probably lose the aircraft, too. So, yeah, they they uh, they just secured the, they just secured the uh, weather decks. Well, except for for a signalman. 
we still had to go up on, on the watch on the signal bridge. But they wanted us to stay inside the signal shack. So, yeah, we uh, we were still up on the signal shack, but uh, we were not allowed to go out on the signal bridge. It was very confusing. Yeah. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you get to watch waves just slam you in the window. Uh, there. Yeah. yeah. We, end, we did end up with some water splashed against the, the, our, our potholes a couple times. Wow. No, I've, I've been out there in 20, 30 foot waves before. I've seen what that's like. It's just like, oh, yeah, well, this ship can handle it. That's why the Navy built it. That's all I would say to myself. <laughs> you know, not like, man, we're in some gnarly stuff here. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, yeah, there's some monster waves out there in that ocean that people will never experience. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the, the cruise ship's trying to navigate around them the best they can, you know, pick the seasons and all. There's a really awesome quote which I uh, which I saw. Um, I think it was a I think it was written on John F. Kennedy's desk, presidential desk, and it says, "Oh God, your ocean is so great, but I, my boat is so small." <laughs> and that is true. Uh, it's there's some there's some stuff out there. I mean. I've had a couple of guys tell me about hurricanes that they went through or uh, my ship, one of the corpsmen that was on my ship, they had to pull into uh, Hawaii and deliver some furniture for this admiral that needed to have his furniture. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Meanwhile, all the other ships were getting sent to another island or somewhere else. Wow. And it was heading into Pearl Harbor. And one of the ships that was in front of them had one guy bounce off a stanchion and kill and die and two guys, three guys overboard. Ooh. They were luck- lucky enough to swim to shore, but uh, yeah, pretty gnarly chop out there. Yeah, that's that's so, yeah, and that's I mean, something which the other branches or really just anybody who's never been in the navy or anything maritime just doesn't understand is that even pier side you can end up with somebody going over the side and drowning, going over the side and get lost. True. And you get lo- I mean, when you're at sea, you can. It's not hard to lose somebody at sea. No, no, it's not hard at all. Especially if you get some waves, it's hard to find them. I mean, yeah, you were, you were telling me about that. We could go into that story next after you, um, take the ship back home and then tell me about, tell me about your Gitmo. That was, we were talking (laughs) about that earlier. That was very. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, after I know I'm kind of bouncing around here a a little bit, um, but after we get done with, uh, Christmas and New Year's, um, around about late January, we, Pass through Strait of Gibraltar again and uh, pull into Road to Spain. And uh, I think out of all the different ports that we hit, we only hit three different ports that were not Spain. We hit Tangier, Morocco, which was pretty cool. Um, had a chance to go down there into the Medina and the Casbah and all that. And almost got, oh, yeah, almost had some really negative experiences happen because I was a very, uh, a very light skinned Caucasian. And I, the, my Liberty buddy was about four foot ten, four foot eleven, maybe five foot, and he looked like a miniature version of Ringo Starr from the Beatles. And uh, <laughs> uh, you know, there, it's no, it's no secret that uh, certain places are heavy in human trafficking. Well, thank heavens, uh, me and that guy got away without getting scooped up. But it, we, yeah, it, things got kind of close there for a while. Come here, nice boys. Want the candies? No. (laughs) Hey, nice sailor boys. I have popsicles. Come to my house. No, you never know. There's uh, there's some risky places. You know, I certainly know about that. There's stuff that you don't see over here. I mean, I talk about that like, you know, when you saw this, I don't know if they were riverines or what they call them, that part of the Navy, they, you know, they get picked up by the Iranians a couple years ago. Um. You know, they weren't paying attention in the Gulf, but I'm like, there was like before the coal and everything else that happened out there. When I was in Desert Storm, I saw that stuff all over the place. We just didn't have Twitter or YouTube or Yahoo to update us the next day. A sailor saw some pirates out at sea on the starboard side at zero two zero. It wasn't getting updated. Nobody knew about it. And if you told anybody, they would be like, yeah, right. Whatever. sailor. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I used to especially be a lot more hostile in the Gulf with all the Iranians. And, you know, lately they haven't been around. Maybe they'll come back after all their fights with our president and all that. But whatever, you know, it is Mm -hmm. what it is. Um, 
you know, everybody's trying to control waterways all over this world. They're trying to do what they do. And that's why we patrol everywhere. But, uh, so you, you finished up in Spain yep. and, uh, Where'd you go from there? What well, happened? Well, we totally turned over to the next battle group. I used to remember the name of that. I probably have it written down somewhere. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, uh, we turned over to them. We, uh, then pulled out to sea and headed back to the, uh, to the States. And, um, when we were crossing, we were crossing and as we were crossing the Atlantic, we were going through a, uh, a time zone every two days, if I remember right. And, uh, they always tr- cross the time zone during the midwatch. And I always wanted to be on the midwatch when they were uh, taking away an hour. That way I'd have one hour less watch. But if they're adding the <laughs> hour, I wanted to be off watch so I could be in my rack and have one more hour of sleep. Yeah. Well, we're, rarely did yeah. that ever happen that way, though. Yeah. So, yeah, we, um, and we, uh, we had uh, tigers on board, which are, you know, people who are uh, family members of the the crew who arranged ahead of time to ride the ship back from the uh from Spain to the states. Yeah, so we get them over there and then before the day before we uh pull into port to uh Virginia, we pull into port into uh New uh North Carolina, drop off the Marines. And uh then we pull into uh Virginia the day after. And, uh, come back to all the hoop de law and the fanfare with all, you know, we're wearing all our, uh, dress blue uniforms and all that. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of cold there. It's, uh, it's, it's February. It's Virginia. So it's going to be a little bit cold. Yeah. But yeah, we pull on in and, uh, later, uh, later on, we, uh, we do our, uh, po- our, uh, post, our post deployment leave cycle where basically we try to get all 100% of the, of the ship's company on leave within uh roughly a uh, one month time period. So I flew back to, to the state, to uh, states, to Kimmer, to Cal- to California to visit my family and, um, uh, saw them and came on back. And, um, uh, then we moved into the shipyard. Uh, we were sitting in Metro machine shipyard, which would actually, that, uh, we were in the, in the background of a, uh, of a shot where there was a, uh, a scene filmed from the movie Navy Seals. Uh, it actually showed our ship. Uh, I can't remember if it was up in dry dock or if it was just sitting in the yards. But it was a scene that, uh, toward the beginning of the movie, when uh, one of the Navy Seal characters uh, jumped out of a moving Jeep, which was going over a bridge. And, uh, of course, there was water underneath the bridge. He jumped out of the moving Jeep and took a long splashdown onto the... Uh, Onto the waters below. So yeah, um, Charlie Sheen. Uh, I don't know. Could have been him. Could have been Michael Bean. I, I'm really not for sure which one it was. Feel free to check out the movie though. Oh, by the way, it's on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> Sponsored there by Netflix, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my podcast is really taking off. Oh, Netflix has moved in on us, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but they could take some of these sea stories and turn them into movies. Yeah, there that's we go. for sure. Or you know what yeah. though. You know, no matter how bad things are, I can always say, I have good news for you. Mm-hmm. That's I just saved a load of money on car trips by switching to Geico. <laughs> <laughs> There's your second career as a voiceover specialist. Geico. That's why you, you live down there in the coast of LA, right? I'm sure car insurance. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing good. You guys just saved a lot of money. You were not expecting this part of the sea story, but I mean, go check your insurance. <laughs> <right now. laughs> yeah, this is my first, this is my very That's first cool. podcast, by the way. That's okay. I mean, we can do this one, and then you can give me a second one or a third if you want, because I get two or three oh. out of people. Because if you could sum up your sea story in thirty-five minutes, kind of hard. Like, unless you want to be saying, like, "Well, I joined the Navy from Alabama. It was nice. There was water." Met a buddy named Bill. We had a lot of good times. Drank a lot of beer. Had a lot of fun. Saw a lot of things. Then I was home working a tow truck driver. Yep, it's my life. Thanks. Did I make that in thirty minutes, sir? Yes, you did. Sign off. Bye. No, no. <laughs> that's what happens. But you're you're back in California now. We'll bring people back into another one because I want to. You know, I'd love you to come back on and do another podcast or do, especially as signalman. And now, you know, both being on the West Coast, you know, we're out here representing. You know, it is. 
I mean, California is so expensive. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> a lot of my shipmates, you know, I live in the Bay Area. It's very expensive here. It's like the Monaco of the West Coast, all because of the high tech companies and stuff. And it's the same. It's expensive down south where you're at too. It's, there's no cheap place to live here, um, unless you get a Fresno, maybe, and that's not necessarily cheap. But uh, you know, I, I think that uh, doing the podcast, being signalman, people need to hear the story because signalman stopped existing. In what year did the right end? Do you remember? Two thousand four. Mm-hmm. That's another story too. That's a good one, and. Uh, you know, you'll probably run into some of your other shipmates and they're going to want to hear your sea story too. Cause that's what my shipmates listen to it. I got civilians that listen mm. to this and they're just like, tell me something new because I mean, think about it. The Navy, the Navy was an amazing way of life. It's not like we worked in a factory, showed up, worked in a factory. We worked in a factory that moved all around the world and we were forced to interact in some fun, some cool, some dangerous, some scary different places. And, uh, I think it makes you grow, but. California, as I was saying, uh, a lot of my shipmates, they get out of the Navy. You try to hold on to California, afford the rent, have a job that pays high enough. This place will kick you out of here. It just does it. It's expensive, Mm -hmm. man. I hold on here by my fingernails, man. It's not easy. Unless you get family out here. You know, was was your last duty station? Where was that? The last duty station before I retired was in uh, Lemoore, Lemoore, California. It's about halfway between Bakersfield and Fresno. Okay. Recruiting no, I duty? was at a naval air station. That seems kind of peculiar. Oh, How that's can right. there be a you know, navy in <laughs> the middle of the Central Valley, which there's the the closest thing that there is to a uh, to, to an ocean out there anymore is like maybe I don't know a mirage, <laughs> <laughs> a pond, a ten by ten pond. <laughs> there's a kitty. Well, pool they used over to here. have Tule Lake back <laughs> in the day, but that got all you know dried up and everything. Yeah, there's some weird places like the Salton Sea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there's some interesting places yeah, in that, California. Yeah, that Salton Sea is way far but, down um, south from, from Lemoore, though. What were you do, What were you doing out there in Lemoore? just uh, on short duty? Well, I actually, I was on the uh, sea do, seagoing uh, strike fighter squadron. It was a uh, FA-18 Delta, if I remember right. It was the two-seaters. Um, yeah, it was uh, VFA-41, the Black Aces. And of all things, I was a rated bosun's mate at that time and uh, got sent on out there uh, for my uh, Twilight tour. Well, so you're a bosun's mate working at an airport, basically. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'm, you know, hey, that's how they do it, man. I mean, come on, I get stuck in a mail room on Methold my last year. So, yeah, I was like, this is not a signal bridge. <clears throat> Why does Mr. Jones keep getting so many pieces of mail? You know, that was my life for the end. But was that a good way to end it? Were you happy with that duty? Or It was what it was. Whatever, whatever. It was what it was. I wish I could right? have done something different. But then again, I wish I could have uh, done all my 20 as a signalman. And uh, me about the uh, when the uh, Department of the Navy decided to disband the signalman rating, um, they gave me a few choices of different ratings. And, well, I made my choices. And then they uh, says, well, shipmate, and of course they use that S word, shipmate, and I knew I was in trouble. And uh, <laughs> says, uh, those, uh, those availabilities are, are not, um, or those are not available for you. So what, we, what we're going to do is, uh, shipmate, and there's that S word again, and according to the needs of the Navy, we're going to give you uh, the rating of most of the mate first class for, your, uh, for the remainder of, of, your, of, your, uh, of your enlistment. Wow. Now, here you are, man. You're in charge of running the cranes. You're a crane operator. Like, uh-huh. I'm not used to this. You know, that's just like, you might as well take a corpsman and make him in charge mm. of unreps. Yeah, you know exactly. I mean? The uh, Yeah, and <laughs> as a first class, as an E6, uh, same thing as a staff sergeant for the Army and the uh, and the Marine Corps, and same thing as a tech sergeant for the Air Force, um, the uh, taken, taken me as... Somebody who has no deck experience, yeah, I, and putting me on a ship, I could end up being the senior rated bosun's mate there, and they could be looking to me for all kinds of, you know, professional knowledge equivalent to my pay grade and equivalent to the 17 years that I had in. Uh, whereas I did not have the slightest of that. And I realized, you know what? 
if I get put onto a uh, onto a ship as a bosun's mate, and I'm expected to be making these senior bosun's mate decisions when I don't have the knowledge to go along with it, I could end up getting myself, or even worse, somebody else hurt or killed. I was like, no, 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 I'm not looking to do that. So I ended up looking for alternative you know, opportunities, and that's where I came up with that uh, VFA-41, that Strike Fighter Squadron 41 out of, out of Lamar. So what did you do on that kind of duty? Did you ch- check out the planes? I mean, what was what was your duties? Well, that's kind of interesting. There's, um, there's two basic departments for enlisted people. Uh, there's maintenance and there's admin. And I didn't fit mm-hmm. into either one. <laughs> There's this job called first lieutenant, and uh, it seems to be a bit of a uh, catch-all. Uh, it's like a master of, oh no, actually, yes, what's that say? How's it saying go? Oh yeah, a uh, jack of all trades, master of none. Yeah. So I was in yeah. charge of the hangar. I was in charge of. Uh, MWR equipment. I was in charge of um, restricted personnel. I was, I mean, there was all kinds of different, I mean, I had a list of probably 25 different primary duties that I had. And, uh, you know, wow. and none of this I knew that I know that I was going to go on walking into. And oh, by the way, when I showed up on board, the person who was the the uh, first lieutenant for me to be taken over from uh, another E six um, went on leave that same day, so I had nobody to get a turnover from. <laughs> so no, no down no, no. So I, I really didn't have uh, really didn't. I basically just got thrown into the deep end and had to try to figure it out. Wow, how interesting. It's so interesting. You end up with all these random situations. I mean, even like the movie, The Last Detail that we mentioned earlier <clears throat> when we were having a conversation before we did the podcast. But, you know, The Last Detail, you, you could have just been sitting there. All of a sudden, you're a brig chaser. You're, you're a brig Actually, chaser. Yeah. Go. Take this guy to a prison in, across <laughs> six states. You're like, huh? Get on a plane with him. Make sure he doesn't run away. How much training have you had on that? Have they trained you in hand-to-hand martial arts? <laughs> Not really. Have they trained you in... Uh, long, you know, I don't know, long range police recognizance. Uh, if a, if a, an escapee breaks away, do you have protocol? No, you're just a guy with a table leg nightstick and some mm. handcuffs. And because you have rank, this guy's going to conform. Okay. And he's going to <laughs> the brig. Why? Because he's not conforming. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, I, one of the things, one of the many things which I did is that I did make a uh, trip over to uh, a brig. But it, what, what, it's, what it was was that we had somebody who was in deserter status, uh, who was over in the Inland Empire, over in San Bernardino, Riverside, something like that. We had to go pick him up at the, uh, at the sheriff's, uh, substation or sheriff's, sheriff's holding station, whatever it's called, uh, pre, pre trail facility, whatever it's called, and, um, pick him up from there and take him over to the, uh, the brig at Miramar. And so we, so we, my day started, it was, this is a long day. It's, it started at about noon when the, the higher ups decided mm-hmm. to tell me, Oh, by the way, you're going. And Oh, by the way, that was, it was Friday. Wow. Noontime Friday. And like, yeah, wow. Not needing to say <laughs> anything about, well, so much for Friday night plans. Yeah, no, no, no heads up or anything right. like this. Just oh, by the way, boats, you're going to be uh, <laughs> you're going to be going on down to pick up this deserter and take him over to the brig. You're going to be you, know, you can expect to be back about this time tomorrow. Yeah, thanks a wow. lot. So, <laughs> yeah, me and uh, yeah, that was one of those uh, where you we didn't have overtime and uh, <clears throat> your free time didn't matter. If it interfered with work time. Well said. You know? So, yeah. <clears throat> and no, there was no get back. No. <laughs> there was like, unless you had a cool chief. I mean, there was no get back. And I did not. Back. No. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, I, yeah I ended, me and one other guy ended up uh, going through the Tehachapi Pass and, um, what was it, Tehachapi Pass? I don't know. We went in all the way down through like the, the what's that called? The Jacarana, Jacarana Forest or something like that. 
um, there's some sort of a, of a national forest over there, which is not forest. It's certain. Oh, Joshua Tree. Joshua Tree National Forest. There we go. And uh, went through all the, the these ups and downs. And, oh, by the way, it was raining. So we ended up uh, having to. We, we It didn't matter that it was raining. We still had to go. And, um, you know, we had our mission to do. And mission must get done. So uh, we were uh, going through this. And we were nervously going through some of these areas, which we were seeing was uh, filled with water. It's like, okay, the three cars before us, they pass through it. The water's not moving. It's just kind of sitting <laughs> still. So, okay, hopefully the water's not going to come rushing. Do you see any water around it? No. Do you see water in around it? No. Okay. Boom. We move. And so we get through that one. And then we then three, you know, undulations later, uh, we have come across the same thing. <laughs> so eventually we, we, uh, we, uh, we somehow made it safely through. We could not use the term, you know, we couldn't, I couldn't call my, my command element back at the base and say, well, there's a saying, turn around, don't drown. So we can't go. <laughs> yeah, that would not have flown with the, with the command element. And, uh, so yeah, we yeah. continued on and got on down over to that, uh, to that, uh, sheriff station detention facility thing, uh, picked up the deserter and, um, got him, Taken on down to, uh, uh, well, before we could take him to the brig, we had to give him a pre-confinement physical. Kind of funny to say that, seeing as how he's already confined with the sheriff's department. Well, this is different. This is a military brig confinement, you know, military brig. So, okay. So we had to take him down to Balboa Naval Hospital in downtown San Diego, right over there. Actually, Balboa is right next to, uh, San Diego Zoo. So anyway, the, uh, we take him down there and we are waiting for like about six hours. For him to get his uh, pre-confinement physical done, that was painful, and uh, so we finally got him yeah. in to the Miramar brig, and we got checked into our um, barracks rooms to sleep at like two o'clock in the morning. Wow! Sounds yeah. like a Navy day. <laughs> So, were you thinking about the last detail the whole time this was, I was going on? I was living the last detail, the almost. Gosh, <laughs> uh, except for that, you know, none of the none of the uh, hijinks that was going on. No. But uh, and then I so I get to sleep. I get to sleep between two and three in the morning. You know, I was tired, but I was so tired I couldn't sleep almost. You know, but at any rate, so what happens? I finally drop off right. to sleep. Okay, good. And then there's this cricket going off. <laughs> like, oh man, I don't know where the cricket is and. The barracks is full, so I can't get myself a different room. And, uh, yeah, so it was just, okay. So try to sleep with a pillow over my head as best as I can. And so I'm like, okay. So me and the other guy, we figured, okay, we'll catch up at, uh, at 10 in the morning, give ourselves a good solid chunk of sleep, and then we'll go from there. Guess what? I got to call it something like 7.30 in the morning from one of my command element people. Okay, you're heading back now, right? And it was like, uh, no, I'm like, I, if I wanted to say the truth, I want to say I'm just about feeling like a one of those people from a zombie movie, you know, one of those zombie extras. <laughs> but, right. yeah, so we had. So you and your you and your buddy had to rotate sleep and duty on the like drive that. back. And so, yeah, we got them back up there and they got up there back up there about oh, about sunset uh, on uh, on Saturday. And, uh, oof, yeah, that was, that was, a, that was a long one. Well, I mean, how much crazy Liberty can you have up where you were stationed anyway? Well, I'd like to have the opportunity <laughs> at least. <laughs> right. True. Now you do get some of those things where I'd be master at arms and like, you're not leaving until this guy uses, uh, passes the P test. Well, he doesn't seem to have to go. It's been like eight hours. I, that's my Liberty, man. Yeah. I know exactly how you feel. But, uh, that's so, so that was where you wrapped it up. Well, we've got three or four or 10 more stories with you, and I'd definitely like to have you back. But, uh, do you have fun doing your yes, first I podcast? Did. Yes, I did. Thank you. And, uh, I gotta say, this is definitely a unique experience.